The Wacky World of Multimedia J. Folks, one of the fun things about YouTube's assortment of trolls is that sometimes they can give you some ideas on what to talk about next. People are flipping their lids because I dared to propose the possibility that AMD could be in a situation where the tail wags the dog because Polaris is not made to compete with Pascal. And so you have the question of mainstream versus enthusiasts. Enthusiast markets are not big a lot of the time compared to the mainstream market. So if you can take the mainstream, sometimes you can stick the enthusiast person on the edge of a cliff because they have a smaller market and things along those lines. That's all business talk, that's all marketing type stuff, and that's all demographics. It's all the sort of thing we could talk about some other time. But basically, the idea was that the Titan X was super expensive, but we didn't have anything this go around. Maybe the TIs will pick up where that left off. But I'm not that concerned. I'm not really so sure that the viability of these super expensive graphics cards is going to remain for very long unless AMD wants to start making more money. That's the way it is when you've got this kind of competition going on. But, anyways, I wanted to say a few words here about this issue again because I seem to have forgotten or I seem to have omitted to mention the speculation that inspired this discussion about the tail wagging the dog, and of course people are flipping out, they think I'm nuts, because they, they think I'm like, oh, what do you think, NVIDIA's gonna leave the graphics card market? How's that possible? Well, it's not something that I cooked up. It's actually speculation that I've seen going around because of another YouTuber, whose channel we will visit right about now. Here he is, Adored TV who really does his homework and has a lot of really uh, nice commentary on various technical issues, including the current discussion about Polaris and Pascal. This was the guy that put together those... He, he does his homework. He definitely goes down into a lot of detail when it comes to issues that, or the stuff that he talks about in his commentaries. The thing is, though, I've seen his commentary, specifically this one, I've seen his AMD Master Plan Part 2 go around and get reference in comments sections. People are saying, hey, you know, NVIDIA might be leaving the industry. What? Where'd you get that from? No, seriously, check out this video. I was going to do a response to Adored TV on this, but he beat me to the punch on this and talked about the NVIDIA side of things shortly afterwards. Yeah, I've watched a lot of <laughs> I've listened to a lot of his stuff, though, so, you know. Anyways. He got around to finally talking about the NVIDIA side of things, so I highly recommend you listen to his commentaries. He does more like slideshow-ish type stuff, but it's definitely worth a watch or a listen if you want to get where this NVIDIA might leave the industry stuff is coming from. Time and again and again, I see his videos or his channel or both referenced in comments sections when people are like, well, you know, it could be game over for NVIDIA in a couple of years. What do you mean? There's, they got so much money, they got all the... Wow, look at this guy's videos, check it out. So, there are some things, though, that I would like to respond to among, that are among some of his uh, points. Specifically, stuff where I think he had trouble seeing the forest from the trees. He likes to get caught up in the technical details of things, however, sometimes you get so into the details that you lose the big picture, but at least he, he admits it. He talks in this video over here about how he sometimes just likes the technical stuff instead of what the frame rate is. So yeah, get past the bang for buck, look it under the hood, things like that be able to enumerate every part in the engine, so to speak, things along those lines. Hey, watch where the sandals are! Yeah, stop kicking stuff under the desk. Right, um, yeah, so I do, even though he beat me to the punch and basically killed my ability to make a big response to his commentaries, there's still a couple of points that he makes that I would like to respond to. 
One of the points that Adored brings up that I take serious issue with, though, is a point that I've heard before. This idea floating around out there that AMD has some kind of edge just because their APUs are in the consoles. I'm not so sure that putting eggs in the console basket is really something to be bragging about these days. CNBC, this is one of the articles I was looking at earlier about when I was putting together my potential response to Adored TV. Mobile game revenue to pass console PC for the first time this year. When it comes to what's making the money, for the first time ever, the mobile stuff is going to edge out the traditional, the more traditional consoles, PCs, handhelds, etc. It really depends on whether you want to call a handheld a console or not, but it, it really depends on what your definitions are. It's citing market research from New Zoo 2016 uh, Global Games Report. And it's very interesting to note exactly what their projected trends are in terms of PC versus console versus mobile. And this is a point that I've been making for quite some time. And this is why I care about things like how power efficient desktops are. The real monster to look out for in gaming is not Team Red versus Team Green with graphics cards. It's not PC versus console. It's mobile. Mobile is slowly but surely gobbling up the mainstream market from the bottom up. And the question is, where does it stop? At what point will desktops right now buoying gaming PC or PC gaming right now, what, at what point will desktops be relegated to enthusiast only devices and the market will get so small that we will lose the economies of scale that make building your own computer worth it in the first place? This is the sort of, some people are saying it's already gone. That you should, just, you should just buy an off-the-shelf system and mod a few parts instead of building a whole system from scratch. Let's go over to New Zoo and take a look at some of these numbers. New Zoo, the global games market reaches just under a hundred billion dollars in 2016 with mobile now generating 37 percent. This is where that idea comes from. So blue is smartphone, purple is tablet, so these two combined are mobile. You can throw in handhelds if you want, but handhelds are, bleh. yeah, they're pretty much dying at this point. Then you have your gray for your traditional TV console, and then casual web games and PC MMO are the greens. Look at these numbers. So starting with 2015, projections going past 2016. 28, 27, 26, 26, 25, and then on the casual side, 6, 5, 5, 4, 4. Gray for the consoles, 30, 29, 28, 27, 26. Handhelds, <laughs> what's left of them? 3, 2, 1, 1. 3, 2, 1, 1, 1. <laughs> Probably got too small. They didn't want to put decimals or something. <coughs> they didn't want to put zero on there if it wasn't actually zero. Then you have the smartphones and tablets at the bottom. 9, 24, 10, 27, 10, 30, 11, 32, 11, 34. And this does not surprise me one bit, because, like I mentioned uh, earlier, you have enthusiasts versus mainstream. Where is the, what does mainstream? Where's the mainstream market at when it comes to gaming? Devices that are essentially computing appliances, console, and especially mobile. What is a console these days? Consoles sell for the same two reasons that I've been saying that they've been selling for the last couple of years their price and their simplicity. The console killer PCs, usually you have to build them yourself or there's no device out there that really attacks Sony and Microsoft with the price of the Xbox One and the PlayStation 4. You just can't find that. But what's to say that mobile can't start chewing away, so to speak, at the capabilities of the consoles? Matter of fact, this is exactly the sort of thing that people have been saying for years. Rewind the clock a few years before the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One came out. People were talking about how if the new consoles didn't come out soon, the tablets and smartphones were going to stomp all over them. But that is no surprise whatsoever. When it comes to appliance computing devices, I'm already involved in the arguments in my family about whether desktops are still worth it, because everybody wants to get a laptop instead. Especially if we end up with GPU boxes becoming viable instead of a little gimmick thing sold by gaming peripheral companies for a major premium. Once you can get graphics onto laptops, desktops, and DIY folks like ourselves, we're going to have a big problem on our hands. 
The next device I would like to show you has 4 gigs of RAM and a quad-core processor. Sounds a little light for a gaming device these days. What is it, you might ask? Is it a computer? Certainly sounds like one, at least on the low end. Actually, it's the Asus Zenfone 2, a 4 gig smartphone with a quad-core Intel Atom. Of course, we know with the restructuring at Intel, the Atom is going to get folded into the entry-level stuff. And, of course, that doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, the Core i3s with some of the power they draw and whatnot, I think it was just a matter of time before the entire low end of Intel's lineup started blending together. So what happened with the Atom doesn't surprise me. But here is a phone with a quad-core processor and 4 gigs of RAM. So, here's the thing, though. Here's the potential, and this is where mobile becomes really dangerous. There are a couple enthusiast phones out there, and tablets, mind you, that have the ability to connect up to a television with mini HDMI to full-blown HDMI. What if, say, there was some kind of wireless streaming, in-home streaming, that went to the big screen from one of these things? Pair that up with a Bluetooth controller. You've got yourself a gaming device. <laughs> I mean, just just read about some of the some of the games that are ending up on the app stores for Android and iOS and whatnot, and how they're catching up to the graphics. That's a you know I think what they're up to like PlayStation Two, maybe even PS Three level graphics. So what's going to happen when mobile and consoles the gap between them closes? This is why I've heard these things about Nintendo's NX being a combination device. You know, basically a combination of a traditional console and a mobile device. So it plays games on the big screen, then goes with you when you want a game on the go. If Nintendo goes through with that, I'll actually give them a major round of applause, because they'll actually be with the times for a change. You know, with old friend codes and the you know, old school blah 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 stuff that Nintendo's been known for over the years. And you know, Nintendo is just, <laughs> sometimes they're just behind the times on things. If the NX can be a combination device that addresses the fact that mobile is devouring the market share of mainstream gaming from the bottom up, if somebody, if, if, if at least one console company could do that, like Nintendo, I think they'd really have an edge when it comes to the coming, I don't want to say Judgment Day or Apocalypse or anything, but... What are you going to do when your console seems like a waste compared to just having a mobile device? Because mobile devices, you know, start in encroaching upon the territory of the consoles. The consoles can't really get much better than they are right now because they'll get too expensive too quickly. Versus PC. But... What happens when mobile start? What, what happens when mobile gets there? This is why, you know, even though AMD has APUs in the consoles, this is why I'm not too concerned about that, because the real monster is mobile. Four gigs, quad core. What can you do on this thing? And it's getting replaced with a Zenfone 3 later this month, so... Oh, by the way, uh, 300. <laughs> 300 just to get the phone from Newegg. I've been tempted to get this thing and use it as an itty-bitty tablet, even if I don't buy service for it. Because you go to buy a laptop, it's going to be 300 plus or something like that, uh, unless you get one of those crappy ones with the soldered-on components or a refurb. Actually, with the laptops, some of the refurbs, like the old uh, Elite books from a couple of years ago, like the Ivy Bridge one that I've been using you know, at my 9-to-5, those are showing up in the refurb market now, and they look like better deals than some of the new stuff. Wild and crazy, let me tell you. But I am not concerned about AMD having APUs in the consoles, because in the long run, I don't think that's going to be a really good bargaining chip when it comes to getting AMD any sort of edge. And then there's stuff like this. So here's some PlayStation 4s on Newegg. They're all in the 3s. Low 3s, mid 3s, high 3s, depending on whether you want to buy a refurb or what game you want to have bundled with your PlayStation 4. Now it's interesting that a couple of days ago, or however long ago it was, not too long ago actually, Newegg actually did a blog entry about this super expensive gaming machine for people that want to say goodbye to consoles for over a thousand dollars US, and then they seem to have forgotten they have a super combo section. <laughs> So here's a, here's a super combo that they currently have in the high threes. It's Vishera based, so it's kind of blue when it comes to the FX series. But I mean, even blue, even blue FX chips with an entry-level graphics accelerator like this wimpy little not-so-big Radeon down there 
still can do still can do some things. And of course, another super combo they have is a big Kaviri box. I think it's an R7. Ooh, XFX. Like the conservative design though. I don't like some of these goofball designs that some of these coolers have these days. Yeah, Raid Max, Raid Max case, entry level stuff to get someone started and you know get windows from somewhere. I understand that the Paul's Hardware crowd is a big fan of gray market key sites like Kingwin and whatnot. I'm not so sure about that stuff, but uh, that's another discussion entirely. However, that's the kicker here. I mean, you can get into this stuff with the hardware at least, costing similar amounts to what the PlayStation would go for these days. Just get Windows on it somehow, or try some of the Linux gaming that's out there with SteamOS or something along those lines. But that's the thing. Here's here's a super combo. Here's a super combo in the same range as the console. So what exactly is a console, other than a, a an entry level gaming computer that sells for price and simplicity as the two reasons why they even sell in the first place? They're simple and they. It's very hard for gaming PCs to compete with the consoles. In this case, yeah, the hardware costs the same, but where are you going to get the Windows license from if you want to go Windows on it? So it's uh, yeah, it's definitely something. Radeon R7. What's it got for RAM? 8 gigs. That's okay. DDR3 1600. This is probably, we're probably going to see fire sale prices on this stuff as we get closer to the launch of the Zen though, with how much the AMD Zen is supposed to steamroll <laughs> the construction equipment processors of the years gone by. Yeah, anyways, and this is the, this is the issue that everybody has to face though, because you can go to all this trouble, or you can just get some kind of gaming appliance, so to speak, and maybe even a mobile device. Give mobile a few more years of development, and we'll be talking about mobile as the main threat, not Team Red versus Team Green. So all things considered, what needs to stop is the infighting. That's what needs to happen. I'd rather not get caught up in the Team Red versus Team Green thing because in the long run it's not going to matter. Whether Nvidia leaves the industry or not, I'd rather see them not leave, but the big thing that I don't want to see happen is I don't want to see those of us who are building our own computers now get stuck having to go back to proprietary equipment because the computer industry has its way, the DIY market becomes too expensive for most of us, and basically we're stuck with proprietary stuff again, which by the way, is what the industry wants, to get their revenge on us for what replaceable parts has done to the desktop industry. So, the way to do that is to have more appliance-like devices, like laptops, tablets, smartphones, gobbling up the mainstream market, even if they have to stomp on the consoles in order to do so. And that's what you game on, that's what you compute on, and you have to go back to the manufacturer for parts, service, support, etc, etc, etc. And it costs more. So, something to think about. Be sure to check out Adored TV's channel for more discussion on things like this. Uh, more discussion on things like this, although I don't think he... I don't think he's always right, of course. I just challenged him on that issue with the consoles. But yeah, it's going to be an interesting next couple of years. The big thing, though, is ending the infighting and getting everybody to stand up and say, you know what, we like our DIY gaming PCs, and no money-hungry industry that wants to lock us into proprietary parts, into a proprietary parts, should stop that. Something to think about. Multimedia J, out.